Very good afternoon to our esteemed guests, speakers, and the audience who have joined us. I'm your host, Aman Agrawal. I wish you a very warm welcome to World Hospitality Expo 2022. We are live on YouTube. And, and today's topic of discussion is the art of hospitality planning by hospitality masters by FSCAI. So before beginning with that, I would like to call Mr. Anand Kishore to join us and uh, speak few words about the speakers, this program, and today's session. Mr. Anand, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Myself, Anand Kishore. I am founder of IO.com. We welcome Mr. Rajesh Chaudhary, who is the founder director of FSCAI and our advisor too. We appreciate his support for the World Hospitality Expo and we are grateful to him from our bottom of our heart for helping to make this event successful. World Hospitality Expo also welcomes our respectful speakers who gave their precious knowledge, wisdom for the benefits of hospitality industry. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Rajesh, please. Good afternoon, everybody. A warm welcome to this uh, wonderful session. And uh, I would like to thank everybody in the panel uh, for joining and uh, really appreciate everybody taking our time. Ananji, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, that you've given us to host this uh, uh, event. And uh, we are really uh, happy that you know we could be associated with you. Um, I would like to uh, start by sharing a little about uh, the association. The association is a thought and it's an idea by many stalwarts who are sitting here. Uh, and uh, I remember a uh, uh, couple of uh, years ago, Mr. Dayal Adwani had messaged in a group that you know he would like to bring everybody together. And you know, uh, uh, also a background of how it all came to my mind that you know we've been doing a lot of events and activities with my previous company. We used to take uh, consultants along uh, uh, with us to our factories and for visits. So I felt that, you know, there is a need that uh, we should bring everybody together on one platform. There are so many associations of purchasing managers and, you know, hot remind. And there's so many associations. But here, there was no association where all the consultants could come together and share knowledge. I mean, imagine the knowledge of uh, the people who design hotels, who design the kitchens of hotels, the amount of knowledge they have, the wealth of knowledge, and uh, the resources that we can pull together to uh, you know, add more knowledge to people who would uh, want to learn. So, uh, you know, came up with this idea and they, you know, took cues from many people, especially yeah. uh, Rajaji, Martin, everybody who I discussed yeah. with India, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rajaji, uh, you have given a very good description of for FSCAI. Uh, yeah. our, our, all the audience would like to know our speakers too. So uh, give me an opportunity to introduce all of you. So okay. our speakers are Mr. Dayal C. Adwani, Mr. Imtiaz Mistri, Mr. Naresh Sahani, Mr. P. Shravan Kumar, Mr. Vishwanath Pandey, and Rajesh Chaudhary ji. Mr. Dayal Adwani is founder director of Hospitality Solutions Mumbai. Mr. Dayal Adwani has over 44 years of experience in hospitality industry. He has started his hospitality journey in 1972 when he joined IHM Mumbai, Asia's first catering institute. Mr. Imtiaj Mistri is the owner of hotel consulting firm, Mistri Associates Hotel Consultant. His firm offers facility planning for star category hotels, kitchen and back of house design, kitchen and laundry planning for hotels, hospitals and institutes. MASC have executed projects pan India in UAE, Malaysia and Africa. We have Naresh Sahani with us. Naresh, Mr. Naresh Sahani is owner of BHS Design World. They are hotels, restaurants and food facility planners, designers, coordinators. Mr. Sahani is associate member of SCIMA and his firm specializes in hotel BOH area, kitchen, food service, back of institutions. We also have on panel with us P. Shravan Kumar, who is alumni of IHM Hyderabad, specialized in kitchen designs, both for hotels and standalone restaurants and institutions, as well as back of house and facility planning for hotels. Been past president of Fire and Security Association of India for Telangana State, and been past secretary of Indian Plumbing Association for Telangana State. His work specially is on energy conservation and safety on design principles. We also have with us Mr. Vishwanath Pandey. Vishwanath mm. Pandey is CEO of Total Hospitality International. He has over 19 years of experience in the hospitality industry. 
Chef Vishwanath Pandey is an expert of hospitality industry in the field of commercial kitchen design, BOH hotel consultant, facility planning, food service planning, and concept restaurant. Mr. Rajesh Chaudhary is with us. He is a founder of FSCAI, a sales leader with over 26 years of experience in managing sales and marketing operations. Mr. Rajesh Chaudhary is managing director of HNS Business Solutions, where they help business improve their operating models, build new strategies, and offer business solutions. He is producer at Ashmita and Amisha Films, releasing their first movie project in January 2022. Uh, all the best for uh, for the movie, sir. Rajesh, sir, over to you. you. Please carry on with the session. Thank you. Thank you so much for the... I think you've covered everything. Uh, but, you know, I, was, I wanted to continue with what I started is uh, basically... It's very important for everybody to understand uh, the importance of this association because uh, the idea of bringing everybody together is to bring all the knowledge and the wealth of knowledge and experience together. And we wanted to, we also want to organize a lot of uh, events and uh, and open house events where we want to uh, give opportunity for people who want to know how uh, they would want to. Uh, come up with hotel projects if they want to invest in a, in a large hotel project what are the things that go into it and also we wanted to standardize a, a few things here uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Shravan Kumar to add a little more about how the idea and the concept of FSCI <laughs> was conceived and uh, we formulated it it was actually registered on 23rd September 2021 and uh, it was formally launched at an IHE event, uh, which is on 24th September, about 25 consultants were there for this uh, launch. And since then, we have uh, been very actively involved in uh, forming the uh, association and, you know, uh, the objectives, bylaws and everything. So, uh, Mr. Shavan Kumar, your experience that now. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rajeshji. <clears throat> I must uh, go on record that to start this association was a long-standing dream of Dayal Adwaniji. He made an attempt a few years ago. He gave this idea, he gave this thought, but then due to whatever reasons, it got a little delayed and now it has taken shape. Absolutely. Now we get into the context, especially post pandemic, 2019 onwards, we have a lot of surprise consultants in the field. I, for the want of any better word, I do not want to substitute that. We have a lot of surprise consultants and uh, this has led to a kind of a confusion among the clients and the potential clients as to whom to approach, number one. Number two, in the last few years, especially in the last one decade, technology had started making very deep inroads into the Indian hospitality industry, where a lot of uh, people were a little slow in understanding, adapting, and then putting them into the projects that they were doing. So it was required that vendors have to start working with the consultants and professionals to see that the product excellence is properly transferred to the projects. That was one background. And then there has always been this issue that all consultants need to have a common platform to exchange their ideas, enhance their own talent and knowledge, and more importantly, pass on the knowledge to the next generation. Now, in this context, we had a few discussions, Rajesh ji, myself and another few colleagues. We all had uh, multiple rounds of discussions with, the, with each one of us again talking to other colleagues and all that. And then finally, the association became a reality. In September, we all in Delhi, we discussed very extensively. And in October 2021, this was formally launched. Now, this event, today's event, the panel discussion that we are having, to my knowledge, Subject to correction by seniors, to my knowledge, this is perhaps the first panel discussion where we have this level of experience, this number of consultants who are simultaneously going on stage for the benefit of the entire industry. This is just the tip of iceberg. This is one value addition to the fraternity. And in the coming days, the association will keep sharing the knowledge to the upcoming consultants and the industry in general and continue to acquire knowledge as a common platform from wherever the knowledge is available from the manufacturers from the designers from the technology experts and so on and so forth 
Now, the association also has a few more objectives. The notable objectives is to work to see that facility planning is included as a curriculum in the educational institutions. Unfortunately, till now, this has not been done. Maybe on and off a few institutions by their own interest might be teaching facility planning here and there. But as an organized field of study, facility planning mm. needs to be introduced because it's, this association will work towards that. The association will also emerge in the days to come to see that we'll work back in front with other organizations and technical expert groups to become a certifying agency for the hospitality equipment. Like we have star ratings for various other equipment, we are also looking at the hospitality equipment needs to be certified so that it will become easy for the end user to identify what to procure and what not to procure and things like that. These are two notable. Third is again to encourage the younger lot to come into the field of consulting. These are three notable objectives. There are a few other objectives, but then in the days to come, we promise as a collective group, as a collective arena, the hospitality industry, especially in consulting field, will see much better days and will rise the bar of the standards. Back to you, Rajesh. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, our first speaker for the day, for today, is uh, Mr. Dayal Adwani. I would uh, once again like to introduce him. Uh, Dayal Saab uh, is an alumni of 1976 uh, uh, Hotel Management Co College in, um, in Mumbai and an ex-chef uh, instructor from 1976 to 1980 uh, for IHM Mumbai. Uh, mentor to many chefs, uh, I think umpteen number of chefs that he has trained and professionals across the globe. So um, his company was formerly known as ABN Associates, uh, Mumbai mm -hmm. in India. Uh, Mr. Advani has been a master of hospitality and a consultant for over 40 years now. Uh, he uh, provides total hospitality project solution to, uh, yeah, and he has provided this solution to over 250 projects in India, UAE, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, UK, North Cyprus, Thailand, Hong Kong, Africa, and so on and so forth. Uh, Mr. Advani, as a hospitality wizard, has been involved from site selection, project approvals, master project planning to micro facility planning of back of the house areas besides project coordination as a master in guiding pmc uh, guiding the pmcs for cost effective and timely completion of several projects mr advani as a hospitality management expert and culinary guru has commissioned several projects uh, hotels and restaurants in india and in other countries with prime culinary standards and hospitality operations systems and controls he has mastered the art of education and is a passionate trainer developing skills of uh, top management uh, to the lower cadre uh, in any hospitality organi organization. As a successful mm -hmm. master hospitality consultant after 40 years of input still in learning and the art uh, uh, to be better than that's his simplicity, that's the person he is. Available 24 seven for his clients in the West and uh, East uh, to support develop uh, for gr growth in the crucial period of the pandemic to ensure all safety standards are com compiled for uh, with uh, for assuring customer safety there mr advani always enjoys bear to build a team and collaborate uh, to create that he is a live example we have been experiencing for the experiencing for the past several months uh, his prime objective is to build knowledge banks of hospitality dedicated and Dedicated to his ment uh, mentor, late Padma Shri Kangam Philip, Principal Emeritus of IHM Mumbai. So today, his topic is role of consultants in hospitality projects. Um, sir, um, I would like you to uh, start your uh, you know, uh, discussion. And um, besides that, I would uh, want everybody uh, sitting here in this, uh, would, uh, in this uh, seminar would uh, vouch for his yes, cooking yes. skills also. We have all tasted yes. wonderful uh, uh, cuisines made by him. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. And uh, uh, he's always willing to impart knowledge. And I am one of the uh, proofs of that, that I, I every time I meet him, I get to learn from him. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, your guiding force. Uh, over to you, sir, Mr. Dal Adwani. 
Thank you, Mr. Anand. Thank you, Mr. Rajesh. Uh, it's really great to be a part of the association which you have founded. You got on this mission, even though it was my vision, but I was looking forward to support to start and I think you really made it. So it's nice to have uh, members joining, joining our association and the few select are here along with you to support the association to go a long way. We all belong to the hospitality industry. When we speak about hospitality, people refer normally straight away to hotels, a place to stay. It's not just hotels and restaurants, a place to eat. There is, there are so many establishments, different grades of establishments, different types of hotels, styles of accommodations which are offered to stay which form a part of the hospitality industry. We, we all have to know that hospitality industry began, we don't know which century it started and how the hospitality projects were designed and built. And they were earlier just small guest houses, inns, hotels, as they grew and the concepts changed. So who all were involved in setting up these projects? Obviously small owners, of course the first prime hotel of India that came up was the Taj Hotel, founded in a vision of late J.R.D. Tata. So besides the hotels and the restaurants, I would like all our viewers, listeners to know what are the various segments of the hospitality industry? Just one. Share the screen. Share the screen. No? We have hotels, resorts. Share the screen. Restaurants, eateries, cafes, fast foods. We have quick service restaurants. We have food trucks. Part of the hospitality industry is bars. These were small drinking places which were now taking shape into pubs and lounge bars of different grades. And we've come across now various banquet and convention centers. Besides the bank and convention centers, we have airport lounges, kiosks, food courts, malls and entertainment centers with various food courts. To support all these, we've seen development of central kitchens and food production units corporate cafes and lounges. Now all these segments of hospitality have called for planning of these projects, developing them, setting them up and to operate them professionally. Besides the hospitality industry, which I'm going to share, besides the hospitality industry, we have the food industry which is growing in a big way, it has grown in a big way. The food industry covers up various food factories. Oh no, page down. Various food industries, packaging food, ready to eat foods. It's not just chips and biscuits and the simple lumpkins what we saw years ago. We see food is packed in different formats. Food is packed in different formats. So, uh, how how does one just start a factory? I mean, you know, they just had kadais and you know fryers, 
uh, to set up these workshops where all these uh, namkeens were done, mithais were made. But today, everything is done in a very modernized uh, workshop, a factory, with all standards of hygiene maintained, packaging which is very classy, very different. So this is called for a detailed working to set up projects to meet up certain standards which are desired internationally and also now by our authorities in India that have set up food standards to prevent contamination. We look at even the cakes being packed up, we look at desserts being packed up, chocolates being packed up in a big way and so also beverages in different formats in tetra packs and bottles and so on. So what happens when a new investor wants to set up a new project, speciality, a hotel, restaurant, cafe, lounge bar, or in the beverage industry, or in the food industry. He first needs to study what is business potential. He needs to confirm what he wants to do is really feasible to do it in the location where he desires to do it. And all this he cannot take a decision on his own. He needs experts to advise him, to guide him, and to detail out the project concept. And then jointly they work out a project cost, confirm the viability, and decide on the source of the funds. How much is the owner going to contribute? And how much is he going to borrow from the fund from the funding banks and the institutions? Based on the project investment to be made, planners are asked to draw out a master plan along with a team of professional experts who are involved in specialized in operating those projects or designing those projects. So a master space plan is prepared to ensure maximum productivity. It's very essential to list the professional experts who are required to appoint, uh, to be appointed to plan, design, build, commission and operate the project. Now, based on all this, the project plans need to be approved from the statutory bodies before the project needs to be really developed and taken up for construction and full investment. So all this has been based on a market survey, business potential and survey of competitors. We see the team of architects and the team uh, of technical consultants working on a project which they work collectively and make a master plan to help the architect to provide a room for every essential area that is required, whether it's a hotel or a restaurant. When I, when I take an example of a hotel project, I would like the developers to know before they think of the architect, before they think of buying the land, they have to consult somebody where they should do the project where there is potential for the project. So as far as hospitality is concerned and setting up a hotel is concerned, they should take into consideration and tie up with a hospitality master consultant who guides them on the location, location approval, after doing a survey for a particular location which the owner has in mind or alternate locations that they may think of. Then they have to think of a master architect and a designer who will help them to prepare a master concept plan along with the Vastu consultant who is so much so important in these days. More important is the licensing architect for that particular location of the particular city who specialized with the statutory requirements of the municipality as to how much areas we can construct and what height we can go up to. So we need the licensing architects, we need the legal advisors, we need the company secretary and the chartered accountant to guide us through our finances 
for income tax matters, GST matters, and professional tax matters. So you see, there are so many consultants required to get into developing a hotel project. We need a finance consultant who will do a detailed project cost report and a loan application. The architect cannot construct the building; he can only design the building. He can do a master plan, but he needs a structural consultant to design the structure for him, to give him the facade what he wants. Then, what's most important is the architect needs a food facility planning consultant, who is guided by the principal hospitality consultant, who also could be a food facility planner, right? So, this food facility planner places. All the equipment and all necessary assets required to develop the back of the house areas to operate the front areas of the hotel or a restaurant or a resort. To back them up, today we have specialized engineering consultants who plan the electricals, plumbing, ventilation systems, and so on. What gives us success? To put us on a platform to continue the business's profits. Today, what eats up our profits is our manpower cost. So, low manpower costs have to be lowered. They can be lowered only if we have an effective layout where we need minimum people to work in a project. They don't travel long distances. We are able to manage properties with least people to work, and all this can happen only if planning is good and right. Everything is placed in right position, and it's all within the reach. So people don't have to travel distances to reach, say, a luggage room or the back office or so on. The second cost which bothers the owner or the operator to run the hotel or a resort is the energy cost. And the interior designer wants light effects, and you know he wants to show the best of the interiors created. And that's with lighting, and there are various ways to cut down energy costs. So we have experts today who specialize in energy conservation. So they are called energy conservation consultants. They, along with the lighting solutions consultant, work on the type of lighting to be suggested to the interior designer, the architects, to highlight the architecture, the exteriors, and the interiors. So that's how. That's what gave birth to the lighting solution consultants. What more important is fire safety and work safety as on today. So we now have specialized work and fire safety consultants. Mr. Savan Kumar would highlight more on that in the days to the come in the in the following webinars. We have project management consultants who help the architect and the entire team to. Handle the construction activities and cut down the construction period, the development period, and complete the project in time in the shortest possible time. More important today again is the security control system. So we have specialized consultants to advise on security control, on information technology, with Wi-Fi, with computerization. We need somebody who's had the experience to advise us on information technology matters. We have brand imaging consultants to take our brand ahead, to show us in the world, to take us ahead, to develop the business, and to show ourselves as the best, serving best food and best services and best facilities we have in our properties. We have an HR consultant to guide us as to what are the compliances to be made for the statutory requirements for. Employees to be recruited, contracts to be done for employees to safeguard us from trade union matters and various other matters. Now, when an owner doesn't wants to tie up with a particular brand to operate the hotel, then he possibly takes support of a hotel operations management consultant who is well experienced in operating properties, and he guides him to. Hire a team of his own, train them, and commission the whole project. Nonetheless, everything is ready to take off. We are specialized business development consultants who help us to maximize our revenues by seeing that 
we get business from different sources we have good levels of occupancy we have restaurants filling up we have people waiting outside and we have maximum sales so people are specialized today how to promote and launch your project on various social media in various formats and they specialize as business development consultants so i repeat we have a market survey we have project profile we have feasibility and viability reports we have project development cost estimates we have a master project planner with the architect and the designers and the selection of the brand operators if desired by the promoters now all this all this is done by the principal hospitality consultant who is appointed who is appointed by the evil school zoom back up who is appointed by the owners now what is the role of the master hospitality consultant he may not work on the drawing board doing the drawings with the architect but based on the survey he has done we have another 5 minutes sir yeah based on the survey that is done he decides on the concept of the project gives a brief to the architect and works out the spaces to be created in the various corners of the resort or the hotel and put them in the right place to ensure that the workflow for the staff the operating team are minimized and working is very effective so that becomes a solution on paper which ensures profitability so this is a master of mind working of a master hospitality consultant so he then takes over with the architect and the other consultants mp consultants to complete the project drawings and start off the role of the facility planner concerned to plan the back of the house areas in detail which includes the kitchens the stores the receiving areas the staff facilities did we lose uh, mr dalatwani yes we did i think his yeah i think uh, we'll wait for a couple of seconds see if he's back if not then uh, we may have uh, do we have any questions uh, ajo team uh, for uh, mr adwani Yes, we do uh, have we will... some questions on YouTube. We are just do... dropping it on the chat box. Okay. Do, do you? Uh, yeah. Do you have him back, or his connection is lost because of internet? Um, uh, his, will, connection, will... his connection okay. must be lost because of internet. Okay. So we'll what we are dropping some is... questions. All right. So what we can do is uh, we will go move on to the next uh, speaker, and then when he comes back, we can he can uh, cover it up later. after we are we are done with every because we don't want to lose time so uh, i would like to um, introduce our ne next speaker uh, a wonderful gentleman i know him a very always uh, uh, ready to um, help and support and you know even for the formation of association he has he had wonderful ideas to share i would like to introduce chef vishi uh, mr vishwanath pandey Pandey ji, namaste. <laughs> namaste. Thank you. Thank you, Rajeshi. He is the CEO, uh, CEO of Prince and Principal con uh, Consultant and founder of THI Consultants Private Limited. Um, uh, he is a IHM uh, Hyderabad pass out of twenty nineteen ninety five. THI Consultants is based out of Hyderabad, uh, Bangalore, and Oman. THI Consultants is an ISO nine thousand two thousand fifteen certified company. Uh, uh, they are a back of the house hotel facility planners and restaurant kitchen and laundry consultants uh, they do uh, kitchen uh, designing according to codex and hasap standards 
some notable clients are KIPIC, Kuwait, uh, Tirumala Tirupati Devasthanam, that is um, the Laddu Kitchen, uh, Ki uh, Infosys, Radisson uh, Blue, uh, Best Western, Fortune, Murali Park, um, Icar Bhavan, Infosys, IRCTC, NSL Entra, um, Upper Nine Protect, Akinani Media uh, School, Cafe Nilofer, I love the tea from there, KS Bake Bakers, factory uh, which is a one lakh square feet uh, you know uh, facility swiss castle and many more uh, and he has also executed projects across india kuwait oman dubai and germany wonderful sir thank you i have you know for sharing your experience uh, we would uh, his topic for today is safety regulation prime criteria for planning um, and your time is about uh, 15 minutes sir uh, thank, thank you, you so thank much. Thank you, Rajesh ji. Uh, thank you, uh, WHO and Ajao. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate uh, Rajesh ji for FSCAI. Fine. Uh, today, I'm going to speak about uh, safety. Uh, safety in all means, uh, means safety for the front of the house and the back of the house. Uh, today, as we're going to discuss more about the designing of the uh, back of the house for hotels and institutions, uh, I would uh, like to run down uh, first on the basics where FSS AI. Friends, the, uh, I think I got cut off. Yeah, should uh, I continue? Uh, uh, sir, we have moved on with uh, uh, Vishwanath. We will continue yours once everything is done because then there was a gap of almost seven, eight minutes. So he has started his uh, presentation. We'll move it back. No, okay. the same way, sorry about this. No, no problem, sir. Uh, Chef Vishwanath, you can continue. Then we'll continue, sir, after everything gets over. Yeah. Done. So there are uh, basically, if you see uh, food spoilage that comes from the uh, kitchens that happens, is basically uh, what it means is the original nutritional value, texture and flavor of the food is damaged. So this happens because of uh, three major areas. So uh, you have a microbiological bi impact that is because of bacteria, fungi, and all that, uh, you know, hitting the food. Then you have a chemical uh, impact that is because of cleaning chemicals, pesticides, and things like that. You have physical impacts too. Physical impacts means, you know, falling of hair and broken glass and things like that, that could create safety hazards. So now to uh, eradicate all this, uh, there are some... Uh, rules laid down by FSS AI. If you look at the international projects, then uh, we follow the ASAP and Codex standards. But uh, while designing a layout, the layout that is being designed, uh, which will be discussed in the future, in the next session uh, by Imtiazi, uh, where uh, the flow is in the pattern where first is purchasing, mm -hmm. second is receiving, then is the storing, then is pre 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 preparing, after which is holding, then comes cooling, and then comes reheating, and then comes serving. So these eight processes of purchasing, receiving, storing, preparing, holding, cooling, reheating, and serving is a very important, uh, you know, uh, design uh, establishment that they have to do before starting the uh, layout design. What else is looked uh, before the design aspect gets in, in terms of... Uh, in terms of safety is that uh, you need to be sure of your location. Your location should not be in a place where you have a dirty passage or you have urinal without doors or poor civic sense, or you know you have unattended garbage bins and things like that. So what are considered? What are the things that are considered in designing while designing the uh, place? So the things that are considered are the floors, the wall, the ceiling, the drain, the equipment, the exhaust and fresh air, and the facilities that are required. So if these things are basically considered, major uh, part of your safety is taken care of in the kitchen. So if you look at floors, your floors must be made with impervious material. That is, uh, you know, material that is uh, strong enough, doesn't absorb uh, things, does, doesn't accumulate dirt, uh, condensation, growth of molds, things like that, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, help in. And also it's, it's smooth so that it's easy to clean and not flaky or plaster. 
So that's how the flooring needs to be. Uh, doors need to be uh, non-absorbent and smooth, so easy to clean. Uh, the whole idea is to have the uh, doors and uh, and the uh, wall and the floors very easy to clean and disinfectant. Now the floor drainage that is created when you do the floor, basically uh, one small uh, tip or uh, the basic uh, fundamental that we have to follow is the slope generally that is made for the drainage is generally in the opposite direction of food preparation that avoids contamination and uh, the drains need to be covered if you see the drains are always covered they prevent from insect and rodents from entering the processing area so the drains also need to be covered which is very important i had some pics to show but that's really fine then comes the food preparation area where an essential part again becomes the ventilation system where the chimney suction has to be right so the calculations for the fresh air and exhaust have to be done in tandem properly the calculations need to be proper so you should have a no noise nuisance kitchen after the kitchens uh, are designed then you have uh, the equipments that you select and the uh, and the uh, food uh, containers that you take so all the equipments that you generally uh, design and suggest are all 304 and uh, in case it's a pharmaceutical uh, company then it goes to 316 the equipments have to be made with non corrosion material which is very important and storage containers always with lids and things like gn pans are good to use so once the kitchen is done then you have the facilities that need to be around what does the facilities mean facilities means uh, things like water supply utensils equipment cleaning facility raw material washing areas portable ice steam generating facilities uh, personal uh, facilities and toilets uh, proper ventilation air quality lighting system and uh, things like grease trap and stuff like that so the water supply needs to be uh, well tagged and uh, done well for hot water systems uh, and uh, portable water and stuff like that cold water and things for cleaning, you need to have your uh, basic three, three uh, sink system where you have wash, rinse, and sanitize. So this has to uh, be in that process. Uh, the, the designing team would be able to help us in uh, telling us how the wash areas are created. Nowadays, you have a dishwashing system also, which also runs on these three uh, systems that are there. Then uh, for the raw materials, generally you have uh, uh, you know vegetable washers you have uh, places for cleaning the eggs and stuff like that because these this again uh, is a very integral part of uh, the whole preparation where things that come in at the receiving are uh, checked well for quality and also uh, you know processed rightly and uh, yes uh, the ice cube machines uh, the nowadays you're getting ice cube machines with uv otherwise you the scoop that you use also has to be food grade you need to use a gloves and things like that and uh, the grills need to be clean for an ice uh, cube system when you come to personal uh, facilities and toilets uh, see uh, identifying the good hand wash sink with uh, soap and uh, hand sanitizer is important and yes you should have paper towels and uh, drying appliances that you would need other than a dustbin so now uh, i had a slide to show uh, on how much how many um, you know laboratories urinals and wash basins that you need um, for uh, men and women according to the staff members so as the numbers go from 10 to uh, 150 160 uh, closely for uh, every 15 to 20 you have one tap of uh, the wash basin that increases and uh, urinals go in the same pattern for every 20 uh, or more and then uh, laboratories for uh, close to uh, 40 or more after uh, say 40 people uh, that you're looking for. In case the uh, size becomes too huge, then uh, the numbers change again, the matrix changes. Uh, similarly, uh, air ventilation in the quality. Now, uh, the way the air conditioned uh, consultants uh, look at uh, air cycles per hour, in the kitchens, it is a little different uh, wherein you know they really look at the kind of uh, heat heat that is generated and the kind of cooking appliance that you're going to use 
but there is a uh, air cycle per hour uh, uh, figure given by the FSSAI for bars and publics, public rooms and cafes, it is 20 to 22 air cycles per hour. For cellars, three to five, kitchen, 20 air cycles per hour, toilets, 15 air cycles per hour, storerooms, three to six air cycles per hour, offices, six to 10 air cycles per hour, and bake houses, 20 to 30. So now this uh, totally actually depends on the equipment that we are going to use and the kind of heat that's going to be generated, the volume of suction required and all that stuff. So that I think will be in the next session again. So those things would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, designed to perfection for having a great kitchen. Comes one more important thing that uh, comes in play when you do a kitchen is the lighting, because the lighting is again a very uh, important prospect that we need to look into. So when you look at food st storage area, inspection areas, your uh, general areas, food preparation services and pickup counters, retail, dishwashing, hand washing, toilets areas. All of these need a little different level of uh, lighting. So uh, we have a level of luminance, the, we call it lux, that is uh, the indicator for the lights that we need. And for a food preparation surface and pickup counters, it's generally 500 lux that we look at. And for the dishwash and hand wash areas, it's 300. Food storage areas, it is 220. So uh, these are the things that we follow. Finally, after the food preparation is done, it comes down to waste disposal. So waste disposal, again, can be of two formats where uh, uh, one where you uh, do a waste uh, disposal to get out a manure and the other could be biogas, where you can again use the gas for uh, cooking uh, on slow fire. So that again depends on the uh, company and the place where the food service organization is. And uh, they take a call according to the requirements that they have. A lot of places like we did a project in uh, Kuwait. Kuwait, they get free fertilizers. So they were not at all in interested on a compost machine. So they rather felt that they do a biogas uh, waste disposable system. So uh, depending on the place and uh, the wastage, the uh, waste disposable machine is created. Uh, coming down to the drainage system that we do, uh, we need to keep two, three things in mind that is the uh, grease traps that you have to create, the starch traps that you need to create. And yes, uh, uh, the lint separator. Lint separator is used in the laundry uh, rooms, but otherwise in the kitchen, it is more of grease traps and starch traps that uh, we, we decide depending on the equipments where it is located. So where you have a potato peeler, you have a starch strap, otherwise you have grease traps around the kitchen. Firefighting, uh, mostly uh, when we look at firefighting towards safety, uh, the kitchen hoods that we make has a fire suppression system. And uh, you have smoke detector, detector, detectors, fire extinguishers, fire blankets that are used in the Middle East for a lot of places. It's not also being used in India. Then uh, you'll also need these uh, fire sprinklers and uh, fire escape ladders and hose. So these things uh, you know, contribute to the firefighting area that uh, these things need to be uh, kept in mind while uh, designing the kitchen for safety uh, norms. So uh, generally a kitchen, uh, well laid kitchen has uh, um, the um, ceiling to the floor that's taken care of in uh, complete uh, uh, norms and also uh, keeping the safety measures in place. Uh, considering that COVID has come in and, uh, you know, the front of the house and back of the house needs to upgrade their measures, the uh, safety norms have been uh, changing very fast. But uh, right now, because the COVID uh, thing has come up, the hotels and restaurants or any food outlet as such uh, follows uh, the following four processes majorly. One is they ensure that vaccinated customers, vaccinated staff, and vaccinated vendors. So these three people, all of them are vaccinated. Uh, they only come into premises so that you know the place is more safe. Stringent sanitizing process is also adhered to because that is something that we really need to do at this time. And managing and keeping the social distancing aspect, uh, which is very important today, uh, is taken care of. And yes, because of which you have a redefined uh, customer service that everybody has gone into. 
So the trump card today is uh, on the contactless check-in that you see in hotels, the contactless dining that you see in restaurants, and contactless payment, which is caught up very much in during the COVID times. So this contactless check-in, contactless dining, and contactless payment has played a major role during COVID and has been a great help for uh, hotels and restaurants to go forward and take it in a very good fashion. Online business has been, again, a great uh, savior for a lot of uh, these food service outlets. And online businesses have come with a lot many new good uh, safety propositions where the uh, temperature of the chef who's preparing the food is also mentioned on the uh, takeaway container. The uh, packer's temperature is also mentioned on the takeaway cover and also the uh, delivery boy's temperature is also mentioned. So things like this have actually upscaled the level and the confidence of the customers to really see how safe uh, you know, things are uh, in during COVID. But considering the designing aspect, as I told you, uh, it totally depends on um, the designing it in the right fashion, where you follow the um, eight places, purchasing, receiving, storing, preparing, holding, cooling, reheating, and serving, and keeping all these areas that you uh, I probably have mentioned right now, uh, which need to be in place while designing. So I would uh, now request uh, Mr. Imtiaz uh, Kureshiji to take up the uh, next part. Rajeshi, yeah. over to yeah. you. Thank you so much, uh, Shiva Shunath. Uh, wonderful uh, sharing about, especially about the contactless uh, operations in hotels, which is uh, need of the hour. Thank you so much. Uh, over to our next uh, speaker, um, a very dear friend, a person who always encourages me, uh, none other than Mr. Imtiaz Mistri. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Mr. Imtiaz Mistri is the founder and proprietor of Mistri Associates Hotel Consultants. Is an alumni of IHM Mumbai 1983. Uh, he specializes in kitchen food service, kitchen food service, back of the house, and facility planning and design for hotels, rest, uh, and resorts, restaurants, clubs, and food courts, corporates and institutions, hospitals. He has executed uh, projects pan India in UAE, Malaysia, Africa, uh, in, and in, is in existence since 1995. Notable brands and clients that uh, have, he has worked with include uh, the Radisson Group, Hyatt Hotels, Ramada Group, Marriott Hotels, Premier Inns, Server Hotels, Keys Hotels, Pride Hotels, Adani Group, and Lodag Developers. Today's topic for him is planning of back of the house areas. Um, and uh, over to you, sir, Mr. Mistri. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Imtiaz Mistri of Mistri Associates Hotel Consultants. And our firm specializes, as Rajeshi said, in planning kitchen and back of house for the entire hospitality industry. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking on a topic which has been neglected for several years, but is slowly getting more and more importance as we develop more hotels. In the past, uh, in the past planning of BOH areas and allocation for BOH areas was not given much importance. But what would happen is the architect would provide a limited space and say, this is for kitchen and ancillary areas. And then we, in those days, we had to struggle to fit in everything. But today with hotel brands and hotel management companies coming into the market, uh, they have specific standards for the space allocation for back of house areas and specific design criteria as well. They lay down very clearly their brand standards. In the West, we have a better term for it. We call it heart of the house, which suggests that it is the infrastructure facilities, the main back end of the hotel or the institution, which is supporting the front end. Uh, but to be very clear, we often call ourselves hotel facilities also. It's not to be confused with MEP services or utilities, which are a different thing altogether. Sometimes the area allocation for a small three-star hotel, for BOH, maybe. 5,000 square feet, excluding the kitchen area. And then for a luxury property like a Grand Hyatt, uh, the square footage could even go to approximately uh, 35,000 square feet. So my, my talk is basically going to be briefly explain the design process, the methodology, 
and then introduce very briefly, as we have limited time, the various BOH areas and certain significant design aspects. You know, perhaps later on, our association would have a more detailed presentation with graphics and drawings and such at a later stage. So coming straight onto the planning process, if a brand is involved, the brand has specific, a huge document, which gives a space allocation, as well as defines each back of area, how it should be and what it should be equipped with. Uh, some brands like uh, Marriott and Starwood actually have a prototype where each and every area of the back of house and kitchens is defined in a layout, which you are supposed to follow as closely. Though it's not really copy and paste because the spaces that we get, depending on the size of the plot, may not match the prototype. The Taj also has a very nice document, which actually guides us food service planners in meeting their requirements. And what's most important is if it's a standalone hotel or a single owner, we act, we replace the operator and we provide guidance. We provide a design brief to the architect defining the location and size of the areas required by us for back to house areas. Certain things like, you know, laundry, staff facilities and housekeeping generally we perform the same level. We prefer the receiving and the stores in the same level. This is for good circulation. And obviously, all back of house areas have to be connected by service lifts. So the process is whether the operator gives a brief or whether we take over, we initially guide the architect as to our space and then we get into zoning plans. Once we basically do blocks that we indicate the space allocation. Now these blocks are not just pieces of squares drawn on paper. We actually have to plug in equipment to make sure the space, are, space is adequate. This is presented to the technical team of the operator or if it's a second time hotelier, maybe his operational team from the first hotel gives their wish list and they act like a technical appraiser. Once the drawings are frozen, we move into subsidiary drawings, which we call rough in MEP, where we indicate the location of plumbing points, electrical points, exhaust details, walling plans, areas to be air conditioned. Everything is provided to us. And these go to the architect, interior designer, as well as the MEP, who actually convert them into GFC drawings. Certain uh, criteria we insist on in the beginning, which I'm sure all my other colleagues will mention, is that for kitchens as well as certain backwards areas, we insist on a sunken slab of about 450 mm so that drainage, putting drain boxes becomes easier. We don't have issues like having to raise the floor and then create ramps and issues like that. We also ask for a reasonable height below the beam so that we can take up the exhaust. So what happens is if it's a five star hotel, you may have three different ducts. If you have spot cooling and double skinned, Exhaust foods, they're actually three ducts running. We require a reasonable space below the beam. So this is best if it's designed at the structural stage so that later on there's no question of trying to change it halfway through construction. Or if we come in late, it becomes a bit of a mess. Uh, what I'm going to get into now is just briefly, briefly run down what are the back house areas. I have to go very quickly because we have limited time. We start off from the back end. We have the receiving area, which is the area where goods are received and weight and check for quality and quantity. Standard things like receiving sinks, weighing scales, and uh, there may be a receiving desk, or there may be a receiving office. And obviously, new innovations include a vegetable washer so that the vegetables are washed before they actually go in preventing contamination. Things like hose reels also will be provided to wash down the area. We generally provide it with a rolling shutter. At the same stage comes this staff entry which may be segregated, which may be segregated, or it may be just the rolling shutter that leads to the receiving area may have a small door, which is opened out for the staff at punch in times. The third area that comes here is the garbage area, which includes a sorting area, a wet garbage area, a dry garbage area. Garbage needs to be checked to make sure there's no pilferage happening. And what happens is, uh, the wet garbage room is sometimes air conditioned or it may be a walk-in cooler or cold storage to keep it from a putrefaction temperature. Uh, very often, most hotels today are insisting, even the BMC, the Municipal Corporation of Bombay, insists that uh, there should be an organic waste converter, which converts the waste eventually into usable fertilizer. So a lot of hotels will have an organic waste converter room with curing racks where they add, add the bacterial content to converted to fertilizer, which is used in the property, basically. Also in this area, sometimes we have a scrap store for different scrap materials, depending on plastic, metal, etc. close by. 
and uh, the idea being that even there is a small compactor which helps to crush some of the things that need to be crushed. The security office is also located here with the security supervisor, the CCTV. The idea being that this is proximate to the staff entry, to the receiving area, and the garbage, which can all be controlled and watched over by the watchful eye of the security. The next area is a time office, which has become kind of forgotten nowadays. It just sometimes is a biometric scanner, or it can be just a very basic swipe machine linked on computers to the main frames. So the time office has become redundant. Uh, then we come to the stores, which are a variety of stores. They may be a general store, an FMB store, beverage store, liquor store, uh, which basically consists of pallets and racks. We have SS racks, we have MS racks, and we also have Cambro or equivalent type of racks, which are washable and cleaner. Uh, important thing I've noticed is stores need to be air conditioned because I found where the stores come in the basement, you know, some of the plastic pet jars tend to melt in the heat. So we generally recommend full-fledged air conditioning, not just exhaust. And uh, normally attached to the stores are various cold rooms, which are different categories for perishables, for meats, dairy products, etc. This depends on the standard of the hotel and obviously the system of issue, whether things are going directly to the kitchen or whether a very basic three-star may just have one cold room, one walk-in freezer and one walk-in refrigerator. Basically, the next area would be the housekeeping, which is the main housekeeping of the hotel, which would have linen and uniform storage. Uniform issue counter would come there. You'd have a room for guest operating supplies. Then there would be the executive housekeeper's desk. There would be a shift desk. There'd be storage for cleaning equipments, detergent storage, flower arrangement room, a small tailoring room for repairing uniforms with a sewing machine, and storage areas for mattresses, upholsteries carpets, rollaway beds. Very often you have a small valet or a mini laundry in case the hotel does not have space for a huge laundry. Where basically you have a stackable washer and dryer and ironing equipment, basically a steam press or a manual ironing table. Generally laundries come in, laundries come in when it's about 150 rooms or more. Uh, but uh, nowadays a lot of people, even small hotels, they put in the laundry because the cost of linen and uniforms nowadays is quite a lot. It's a major investment. So what happens, people prefer to have a laundry to look after their linen and uniforms. So you have basically washer extractors, tumble dryers, calendaring machines, flat work ironers, steam presses, a dry cleaning machine sometimes is a must for the front of the house uniforms. And sometimes we ask for at least 1500 square feet so there's proper aisle space in a laundry. Generally, as I said, the housekeeping laundry and staff facilities should be well located, easily close to each other. Staff facilities basically consist of locker rooms, toilets, showers. In the olden days, we had separate three categories, executive, senior staff, junior staff. But now we have common facilities for everyone. And uh, there's no such separation as such. The lockers, individual lockers are provided through polishing by machines and obviously benches. Sometimes there's a bunker room for people to rest in break shifts or if there's a late night and you know they can't get home, so they stay overnight. That's a very common thing to have a bunker room close by. Uh, a lot of hotels that have banquets and uh, they have a lot of outsourced staff. So sometimes there's a separate toilet locker facility for the staff not to mix them up with us for temporary staff or outsourced staff, especially catering staff in certain places when they have heavy banquets in the, in the hotel. The staff cafeteria also follows the same principle. There's no EDR, it's just common it's common seating for the everyone. Executives, junior staff, senior staff all eat together. And even the necessity for a dedicated staff kitchen is slowly being got rid of. And food normally comes from the bulk kitchen or the banquet kitchen. But we are, we are trying to create a good atmosphere in various uh, staff, staff cafeterias with furniture, TV and music and such things. I'll have to go a little faster. We also suggest a staff recreation room with various games that people can have. And some brands even actually have a staff gym. So the idea is when the staff takes a break, they are relaxed in a colorful atmosphere. A first aid room or a nurse or doctor room is provided where a nurse or doctor comes in on certain days and people, the staff can look in on them and be checked for various ailments and have routine examinations. Another proper thing is driver's restrooms and toilets, say like, you know, from 
say a place a hotel like in pune which is in driving distance from mumbai so you know people drive in so they want a place for their drivers to rest in use toilets so this is sometimes segregated then coming lastly to the engineering department the planning the plant and machinery is basically designed by mb consultants but as a back office planner as a back office planner we we provide things like the chief engineer's cabin an engineering workshop with work benches and various engineering stores with materials for paint for the, you know repairing furniture electrical things spare parts basically there are certain support ancillary areas to the kitchen which go in the basement which i won't go into since we're not getting into kitchen is like the veg prep the garmaj and the butchery which are very often not located at the kitchen level uh, other smaller things include banquet stores which may be two types banquet furniture stores and something for operating assets coming to back end offices which i'll have to go through very quickly uh, we generally want them closer to the service lists because guests don't come here so we basically have the accounts we have the hr the training department is part of the hr and normally the system is not to have cabins but small cubicles and open work stations uh, both the hr and the accounts apart from cubicles for the head also will have small uh, filing rooms or record room which is actually requiring a lot of space for filing purchase department again with purchase assistants and the purchase manager in a cubicle are normally close to the stores uh the back end offices behind the actual back office behind the reception is normally to house the reservationists and normally the telephone operator and the front office manager front of end offices are sometimes detailed by us and taken over by the interior designer for beautification which we gm fmb manager the sales and marketing manager and their relative executives maybe a common executive secretary to act like a secretary to all the managers and uh, uh dedicated banquet sales office is very important there's an it department where the main file server hub is we generally don't recommend it in the basement because of flooding but generally this is where the main hub is located and there are work stations for the it staff we also have maid stations or housekeeping pantries on each floor which have cupboards a sink with drain board place to park the trolleys another important thing we are doing nowadays is every alternate floor we are putting in a single Use staff toilets, so staff don't have to go all the way down to the staff facilities. And alternate floors, we are also providing ice cubers so that the room service waiters find it easier. In fact, abroad the guests go and help themselves to the ice cubes themselves. The room guests. But I think the Indians are a little laid back. I, as I said, I've intentionally not gone into kitchens and satellite pantries. Uh, getting into finishes very very briefly. Flooring is basically quota or non-skid vitrified tiles, which are acid and alkali resistant. uh walls walls are normally glazed or vitrified tiles uh the false ceiling can be a powder coated aluminum uh, panel or composite panels basically a clip in time so they can be removed and accessed easily and all over we have edge protectors rubber bumpers metal bumpers to prevent protect all the this thing all the uh, back of house area passages electrical sockets are obviously industrial sockets with msb uh, mcbs and one last thing i want to stress is that ac is mandatory in almost all the bike wash areas we do try to trim but in reality you need to provide air conditioning everywhere and exhaust in certain areas uh, i've touched 15 minutes so i hope my presentation has given you a little bit of light on the importance of bike wash areas and i hope that all the prospective hoteliers or hoteliers who are making their second hotel will provide accurate, uh, accurate space adequate space for their back office areas and make well planned back office areas because as i firmly feel the back of house is truthfully the heart of the house of the hotel thank you very much and stay safe and well thank you thank you so much antia sir it was really wonderful and very informative before i could uh, you know introduce uh, our next speaker i would like to say something i want to take us back to china and we were in china and uh, we were traveling in a bus to one location to the other and there is this gentleman in this bus who is not a chinese but he knew so much about china that everybody was spellbound and was very curiously looking at him and outside the window whatever he was saying was true about china and then you know we were zapped that he knew so much about china. none other than our next speaker mr shravan kumar Mr. Shravan Kumar, I know uh, you know uh, very closely associated. A lot of our uh, events that I've done in the past, he's been a part of it. So as a speaker, I know his strengths. 
uh, a warm welcome to you, sir. Um, a little about him. He is a co-founder of Excellent Hospitality, a Hyderabad-based hospitality consulting firm. He is an alumni of I IHM uh, in uh, 1987. It doesn't mention the college. Is it IHM Hyderabad? Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, he received his initial training under established and seasoned hotel project experts before starting off as a freelance freelancer in 1993 and establishing this company in 2003. His core competence include designing commercial kitchens of any size and capacity for various end users, back of the house and facility planning uh, for hotels, mostly mid-sized greenfield projects. His successful projects are spread widely across the country um, in several states and comprise of hotels, clubs, uh, uh, resorts, standalone restaurants, food, uh, food courts, multiplex, uh, commissaries, um, facilities, uh, clubs, uh, convenience uh, centers, central kitchens and kitchen, kitchens of corporate houses. He has been a visiting faculty for facility management at National Academy of Construction, been part of uh, past president of Fire and Security Association of India, Telangana chapter, been the secretary of Indian Plumbing Association, Telangana chapter, where he uh, conducted and participated in important events related to fire safety, security, automation, and water conservation. He is also a life member of Indian Society of Lighting Engineers. He continues to remain a learner, keen, keenly follows uh, uh, the regulatory developments like the National Building Code, the Fire Code, the, and makes his uh, project designs comply to these. The second uh, vertical of his firm provides MAP consulting, not only to uh, hospitality projects, but uh, to a wide variety, including malls, multiplexes, uh, medical colleges, hospitals, re retail showrooms, industrial facilities, etc. Safety by design and en energy conservation by design are two of his strong principles applied in projects. He is one of the founders of the Food, uh, Food Service Consultants uh, Association of India. And his topic for today is energy conservation. Uh, Mr. Uh, Shravan Kumar, over to you. Five minutes is done, so ten. No, I'm kidding. You take your. Thank you very minutes. much, Mr. Rajesh. You're being very kind. You you spoke uh, you spoke so much. I think I, I won't be able to speak anything now. First, I'll make the situation lighter. Coming to the China experience, I'll let the cat out of the bag because of my flight timings. I landed in Shanghai city one day ahead of all of you. So I took advantage and I went on a tour of the entire city. That's how I could tell you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Not that I knew. Okay. Now, thank you so much uh, to all my co-panelists, uh, Mr. Rajesh, the moderator and the Azure team, as well as all the viewers who are on various platforms watching this episode. I will try to touch upon energy conservation by design very briefly. It's an endless topic. Now, looking at the context, the real-time case study is in around 2010-2011, the Panama Bay Sands at Singapore was open to public. Various facilities got open spread over a few months of time, 2,500 plus rooms with almost about 13 lakh square foot of a convention space and so on and so forth. Their first year energy conservation bill came to 100 million Singapore dollars. And the promoters did not anticipate this kind of an ex expenditure. Neither did the team of consultants who worked in the project anticipated this kind of an expenditure. So they immediately pulled up their socks and they got down to the job. And in the next one year, they have invested nine and a half million Singapore dollars in various energy conservation measures. And once they did that, their next year energy bill had come down by 11%. And that 11% continues. So this shows us that the payback period of any investment in the energy conservation can be very, very effective. Our firm, we had taken up energy audit of an established star hotel in the city of Chennai, where the promoters were worried that their energy bill is going beyond any tolerable limits. And we had given a master plan and a blueprint for energy conservation measures. 
and with an investment of approximately a crore of rupees, we could bring down their energy bill by about 20% per year. So that's briefly. Now let us look at various avenues where energy can be conserved. Conservation of energy, saving of energy, generation of energy, whatever that we talk about. Cross usage of energy generated in one department or another department all have a single objective that is to save on the expenditure. Let us understand promoters will be interested only when we talk their language and their language is money. The entire country of India had shifted to LED bulbs from CFL, not because it is more efficient, but because it is more economical. That is the reason. So when we talk about energy efficiency, we need to convey the bottom line to the promoters. And I'm sure all of us do that. Now, starting for a project, if we look at the outside, and I'll take on with, uh, with what Mr. Indias Mistri has said, he started at the outside and started coming into the inside into your micro level. We look at any building. Now, today in many cities, we find huge buildings in a vast open spaces with no greenery anywhere. And given the kind of elevations that these buildings have, we create what is called the heat island or what is also called the hot island. Because of the lack of buffer zoning, these buildings attract a lot of light. In the process, they also attract a lot of heat and this heat is translocated and percolated all around the building, creating a heat island effect. So the ambient temperature in and around the building is much higher than what it ought to be. One way to overcome this is to look at a venue plantation or a peripheral plantation. Choose tall growing native species so that after three years they become absolutely maintenance free and they need to grow tall so that their shade will act as a thermal buffer. The another thing that we can do is have as many water bodies as possible. It can be along the driveway, it can be at the porch, it can be the backyard, it can be the courtyards, it can be the banquet lawns. See that we have as many water bodies as possible, but also try and make as much of this as a dynamic water body instead of a static pool, have fountains, have cascades, have falls and things like that. So they cool the air, so eventually it will cut down on the expenditure incurred on air conditioning or cooling the ambient temperature inside the premises. Now, one good example is uh, ITC Sonar Bangla in Calcutta. They have a huge uh, pool which has become a lotus pond and that cuts down the temperature by a few degrees as we go around in comparison to the surrounding area. Now, an interesting fact is if we go to Western India, we find a lot of uh, forts and many of these forts have moats or the water bodies or what we call the water moats all around. Initially, the thought was these were a security and the protection angle, but then subsequently it was identified the water moats have contributed to cooling the soil inside the fort area. So the area inside the fort is much cooler than what is outside, considering the overall weather conditions. And these have been a fantastic source. Same thing can be applied in the hotels and try and create as many courtyards or as many large open spaces, have some water bodies in that. So the overall load of air conditioning will reduce and that will come to a considerable saving of money. Even if 2% reduction in the air conditioning cost is big, and this can be very, very simply, very easily achieved. And the water bodies are not only an energy conservation point, but they also add to the aesthetic value of the entire hotel. And then we are looking at what kind of an elevation we have of the building. We also take input from the Energy Conservation Code, that is the ECBC, Energy Conservation Code of uh, India, which specifies what should be the minimum window to the wall uh, ratio. Going by that, it's very important that at least all the external windows, we choose the glass or the glazing very, very carefully. We can have a double glazing units or a multiple glazing units and go for a non-reflective glass. So it will allow only light penetration and it will reflect heat outside into the building. So the elevation and the finish of the building plays an important role. Now, all these are leading to a direct impact on the electricity consumption of the building that we're talking about. And then we come into the design of the building. If we have rooms, I'm talking about the guest floors, if we have 
single loaded corridors like we have the Oberoi in Bangalore. So if you have the single loaded corridors, you can save on the need to illuminate them at least in the daytime. The full daytime you don't need to illuminate. At the same time, you don't need to pump in fresh air into the corridors. So that will also save money on the electricity as well as uh, HVAC. I don't call whether it is air conditioning or air cooling or whatsoever. You will eliminate the need to pump in fresh air into the room corridors if you have a single loaded corridor. And then similarly, we also look at orientation of some of the public spaces or public facilities. Now, banquet halls, where we have a banquet halls, you might have uh, glass, you might have glazings, you might have openings on one or two sides, but definitely at least in one large wall will be a dead wall. Try and orient these dead walls if your banquet halls are in the external side of the building towards the west so that the heat impact is taken by them and create a double wall insulation there. So the heat will not penetrate into the building and the double wall insulation design will take away the heat from outside to outside. So the inside of the areas are relatively cooler. Then another thing, while we're talking about a banquet hall, we can even look at the pre-function spaces. Can we reduce the height? If the architect and if the interior designer agree, function halls, that is your banquet spaces can have whatever height, maybe six meters, seven meters, eight meters, or whatever height that we're talking about. But if we can effectively reduce the pre-function area heights, there are two, three things that we can achieve. One, the volume of air that requires to be managed can be cut down by half, number one. Number two, the upper part of this pre-function area can become a mezzanine space and that can take care of a lot of uh, BOH facilities which are associated with the banquet hall itself. We can have a banquet sales office, we can have a furniture store, we can have an audiovisual center, we can have a business center required for the banquet halls, we can even have a couple of organizer suites or whatever. So it is not only an effective space management, but more importantly, by reducing the area of air that needs to be cut down into half, you are saving that much of electricity required for air conditioning. Then again, uh, the next point that we can look at is what kind of air conditioning systems. More than 50% of the electricity consumption in a typical hotel building is taken away by the air conditioning. What kind of an air conditioning system? Yes, today the occupancies are very dynamic. Occupancies of rooms as well as occupancies of the restaurants, the coffee shop, the bars, and the lounges are all very, very dynamic. So it is very essential for us to have a VFT-based uh, system so that consumption of electricity is automatically adjusted based on occupancy sensing. But at the same time, we can look at to counter the enhanced cost. But they, normally the promoters will keep coming and say, this is very high, very, very, very high cost, very high cost rather. that. Probably you can compensate, you can still look at deductible package units for banquet halls because the banquet halls will have a uniform occupancy. They are only on and off. So there you may not effect, uh, always require a VFT driving system. So that will help you to balance the capex and achieving the same end result that we're talking about. Then, but if you are going for an air cool, if you are going for a water cooled chillers, it's very, very essential that the cooling towers maintain adequate spacing between them. Sometimes we find in the terrace of the building or terrace of one of the blocks of the building, the cooling towers are very tightly spaced next to each other, but that will not allow air circulation. So there has to be a proper spacing. Unless we maintain proper spacing, then the cooling towers will not achieve their purpose and they will have to work overload. So that will not serve any purpose. Then the next point now it is also becoming mandatory that solar power generation. Some states have already made it mandatory that a certain percentage of your electricity will have to be captive generated within the premises and uh, go for rooftop solar power generation. It will help you. And uh, today, 150 watts of energy can be generated in one square meter. And the price has been coming down. When it started, it was roughly about a, a lack of rupees. Now it is something like 40,000 rupees. So with a payback period of less than two years, you can get back the entire capex spent on the solar power generation. And then the benefit of solar power generation is you can connect it to the grid. So you will have a net zero effect. Whatever energy that you are not consuming, but you are generated, give it back to the grid 
and you will save a lot of money and time. We have a recent experience that we worked in a DPR for one of our clients who was applying for a land allocation for a five-star hotel in Andhra Pradesh. And after we submitted our DPR, they raised questions saying that, give us minute, in-depth, accurate calculations of the electricity consumption and how much electricity will you be able to pass on to the electricity grid because there was a uh, reimbursement policy. So the government wanted to understand how much money we will get back from the government. Not only how much money we will pay to the government for the land acquisition, but the government wanted to know how much money we'll get back. So now these uh, are also becoming extremely important. At the planning stage itself, we need to work out this effectively. And then, yes, that's about air conditioning and that's about uh, HVAC. Now let's get into water. It's Water is going to be the most scarce commodity progressively. In the, in the next few years to come also, we'll see that probably it will be uh, much, much higher, many times more expensive than what it is today. And it is ideal from the energy conservation point of view to have a closed loop water management system. When I say the closed loop water management system, see that not a single drop of water goes out of your premises. Now there are two, three sources. One is groundwater, harvest your groundwater responsibly. Second is get your municipal grid water, try and get municipal grid water at a portable quality, use it for portable and drinking and cooking purposes only. And then reuse the water. Whatever water is used in the rooms, 90% of that water, only 10% is consumed, 90% of the water goes down the drain. Ensure that you have a dual plumbing system, black water goes away separately and the grey water gets into an STP. Treat the water to a near potable quality, bring it back for flushing in the toilets. Then you use it for irrigation. And now we have done one project which is uh, to be shortly commissioned that we are using this treated water, we are bringing, we have got it to a certain acceptable quality. We are using this treated water in the dish wash and pot wash in a project and where about 5,000 people are going to be working. It's an IT park, about 5,000 people are going to work. And, uh, and when, while we are at a water, the cost of water will definitely come down when we make our people more responsible. Till today, water is seen as a cost which is apportioned under the engineering and maintenance department. We have to take away from that. See that the cost of water supplied to the kitchen is treated as a raw material cost to the chef. Let it be included in the food cost, then you'll understand. And progressively, if you become more responsible, then you also compute the volume of water which is exiting the kitchen and add the cost of treating that water back into the food cost. You'll have wonderful result. You'll have wonderful results. We've already started working in that in a food processing industry that we've done. We have we have found out some wonderful results, and this is definitely helping. Now, as we slowly get into inside and inside, when we come into the kitchens, yesterday Mr. Nareshani casually mentioned a point, yes, which is a very important issue. In the kitchen, make sure that you have inverted beams at the roof level so that you can avoid two 90 degree bends in your exhaust and fresh air ducts. Every bend adds to the resistance and any addition to the resistance, you will have to increase the size of your blower or the unit, which means that you will spend more and more electricity. So right at the planning stage, work with the structural consultants, work with the architects and see that if not everywhere, at least in those directions where your ducts have to exit and enter into the kitchen, your beams are inverted, number one. Number two, also see that your kitchens have a fall ceiling as low as possible, eight and a half, nine feet. You don't need more than that for a working level. And uh, yes, Mr. Mthias Mystery said, yes, go ahead for a powder coated aluminum. I'll even say go one more step, go for a stainless steel uh, fall ceiling. Go for a stainless steel fall ceiling for not only in aesthetic, but also they reflect more light. The uh, powder coated aluminum does not reflect as much light as a stainless steel. So go for a stainless steel. So again, what is happening is you are permanently locking one very significant volume of air, which does not need to be recirculated. So the volume of air above the fall ceiling and below the actual slab is permanently blocked. So that much of volume is cut off from your kitchen ventilation system. And in some areas, this can be as high as about 10 to 
10 to 15 percent of the volume that you don't need to. That is a extremely significant uh, saving or conservation or whatever you call it. And the same logic we can apply to any of the back of the house areas also. Irrespective of whether you air condition, you don't air condition, whatever you do that, give a comfortable height and then you block off that space so that your air management cost is reduced. Then another very interesting fact that we can do is we target to become a zero discharge campus, except the scrap, nothing should go out. And now I'm talking about the kitchens or the sunny kitchens or whatsoever. We have successfully worked uh, on value addition, you were not the principal consultants, but we entered as value adding consultants into that. We came up with a large kitchen, which is a zero discharge camper. Nothing, no water, no drainage. We do not have a municipal storage or a drainage grid connection. We do not have a municipal water connection. And progressively in the next two years, we are also trying to see that we will not draw any electricity from the electricity grid. Rather, we will give it back. So what we do is it's a sandy kitchen. And it makes about one lakh meals a day. And the entire organic food waste is now reduced into feedstock for a biogas. We generate captive biogas and we use it for heating and uh, steam generation purposes and lighting purposes within the campus. So solid food waste does not go out of the campus. The water that we use, we use the entire water and after that, we make it to a near potable quality and we give it to our neighbors who are using this water for irrigation purposes. And they have huge plantation. They use this water for irrigation purposes. They're extremely happy. I'll try to conclude in two, three minutes. Now, what we were looking at, yeah, I can see Mr. Rajesh Chaudhary's expression. Okay. <laughs> now, what we will say, it's extremely essential that hospitality consultants, kitchen consultants, facility planners, back of the house consultants, by whatever name that we call it. We sit with the MEP team very, very uh, right since the beginning, and we maximize the building automation design. We have predictive maintenance schedules to be told to uh, the maintenance team, see that the machinery wear and tear is cut down by preventive maintenance, predictive maintenance, make sure that all equipment, especially your refrigeration equipment, thermostats are replaced, coils are cleaned, the nozzles are cleaned, and this will lead to more efficient working of all this equipment. The cost of a preventive maintenance is much lower than the money that we save in possible wastage otherwise. In possible wastage otherwise. And the last point I will take, make it mandatory that you have energy audits at least twice a year. Have at least twice a year energy audits. Focus on water. Focus on electricity. Focus on air conditioning. And more importantly, focus on solid waste management. We, we, we don't pay too much of an attention, but the wastage factor is extremely high and how effectively we can use it, let us do that. If we do that, then I'm sure if even a few of these steps, what we discussed now are implemented, it will easily lead to anywhere up to 5 to 10% of the energy conservation of the overall building. And the incremental capex will be recovered in less than two years at 50% occupancy. So I'll halt here. I will take questions as and when they come. Thank you, gentlemen, for patiently listening. I'll yield the space to my colleagues. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, you are known to be mesmerizing the crowd with your wonderful words. Uh, over to another uh, young gentleman who is always young and handsome. Wherever you go in the international exhibition, so many people clicking pictures with him. So, so very handsome. Uh, that people over the world say, especially my ex-boss says. So <laughs> without taking much time, I would want to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Naresh Sani. He is the proprietor of BHS Design and it's, it, it was founded in 1945. Of course, he did not found it. It was uh, by his uh, late father, Bhagwan Sani Ji. Uh, and is a BCom and Cost Accountant, alumni of IHM Mumbai, 1983. Uh, BHS Design World specializes in hotels, but back of the house areas, kitchens, food service, back of the house facility planning and design for hotels, hospitals, restaurants, clubs, and institutions with large kitchens from 2,000 square feet to 100,000 square feet. 
BHS Design World has executed projects pan India, UAE, England, and Africa. Notable brands clients that uh, they have worked with are President Hotel, uh, Salter Nepal, Grand Hotel, uh, uh, is that Solitaire Nepal, um, uh, Grand Hyatt uh, Hotel uh, Goa, Sheraton Group Four Points, uh, 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 Sheraton Group Four Points Navi Mumbai, Merit Hotels, Light Bite, Risa Hospitality, that is I45 Cafe. Kala Goda Cafe, Loda Developers, For One World. And then he specializes in providing turnkey designs and coordination special uh, services for all civil construction and finishes fitouts uh, of all MEP, including electrical, hydromechanical, HVAC, fire planning, fire alarm, and firefighting and gas piping uh, with all safety and alarm systems. This topic for today is civil infrastructure and MEP planning. Sir, so over to you. 15 minutes we have, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, we have, we will have to finish by four. So 15 minutes for you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Thanks, Shavanji, Imtiaz, as well as Chef Vishi. I'm pleased to be here in front of you. I hope you can hear me clearly. And uh, the, the fortunate part of my life has been that I was exposed to the hospitality industry right from childhood. And the person who had ingrained into me the cost effectiveness of making quality pro projects and having them operated and maintained easily is where I was really, really exposed to uh, keeping everything under control. Uh, just to give you an example, at the same time when President Hotel was being built, uh, that time Oberoi's was being built, and as well as the, the airport center hotel, which is now, of course, the, uh, the hotels for, for different groups. They all were being built at the same time. And it was a surprise to the government that the low way, the way the low cost hotel was built, the president hotel in, in Cup Parade, none of the hotels could even match it. And they were spending more than three times the amount of money. So it starts from there. And that's the background from where I come from. So understanding that in today's times, there is such an amount of sophistication in all the equipments and fit outs are, which are required for modern hotels to work, not only from the point of view of hygiene, but also from the point of view of safety and uh, defense requirements to protect the employees working within. I was first start up with the thing like, uh, what are the fit-outs which are required to run an effective establishment? All our colleagues here are quite proficient in designing the kitchens and back of house areas and other areas. Even some of the front of house areas are being handled by them. We come into the picture at the same time as what they do, and we too also design. But here is the twist. Designing and specifying everything that the brand asks for and coming up with a reasonable cost benefit analysis of what it should be provided, we are very strong on understanding both the civil and the MEP requirements to fit out all these equipment. Uh, the major thing that needs to be done, which is something called as value engineering, which has come into play in the last 10 years, where everything that is fitted in your kitchens and your back of house areas all have to be studied, analyzed with a mic fine microscope and, and, you know, and understand whether it is needed, what is the options which are available and how they should be fitted. I'll start with civil works. The civil works that we were doing earlier in those times were just simply putting quota. But in today's times, the level of hygiene which are required for running kitchens is supposed to be much higher of course, depending on the budgets which are available. Now, the flooring finishes which are available, which replace quota, start from as low as vitrified, fully bodied vitrified tiles, which can be fitted very accurately, going up to high quality PU puff, PU drawer floorings, which are highly sensitive areas we should be fitting them, like in cold rooms. Now, before we move further into the, into the MEP, we always pick up from the, from the operators as well as from the kitchen designer, 
what are the specifications of the MEP requirements and the various um, roughing in drawings which are which come in from the kitchen designers. These are very important to understand. And then what happens is we prepare what is called as a design basis report. A design basis report roughly spells out all the consumption and the cost of operating the kitchens. And these start with electrical, plumbing, gas piping, HVAC planning, and the power consumption for everything else, as well as all the things which go into run, the running cost of any property, whether it's a small restaurant, a cafe, or even a five-star hotel. And since all these uh, hotels and buildings are all living buildings, we need to ensure that their maintenance cost, not only while operating, but also at the time of fit out is at the lowest and the build quality is good enough to last 15 to 20 years without a problem. Then each equipment that is to be hooked up needs to be understood. So certain equipment may have even gas, may have power, may have water connected to it, as well as drainage. And the whole equipment to operate may require fresh air and ventilation also to see that it is maintained correct. So in other words, so many details have to be provided to make any equipment work successful. Therefore, before we get down to really designing these areas correctly, we need from the kitchen planner a lot of details as regards what are the MEP requirement of each equipment. And before it goes for the uh, what we call as a GFC stage, we have to do what is called as a sign off from the equipment suppliers. Because what happens is this sign off comes off at the, after the ordering. But before that, we sit down to work out the budgeting for the whole project. And this is advice is given by the, by the procurement department, or it sometimes comes from the kitchen designer himself. Once the budgets, are given to the owners, they need to give us a clearance as to whether they would like to go with those products or not. Operators come into play, the brand, the owners come into play, the operating teams who are going to be appointed in advance, the early advance team also come into the picture and hence starts the selection and finalization of equipment. We know of a particular property where, you know, the designers had specified MKN, which is one of the top brands of the world, but when the total costing came to something like about 4 million for that particular hotel, the owners almost had a heart attack. And they said, no way that I'm going to be spending on so much on the equipment. So the planners had to rethink, put their thinking caps on and come back with other alternate brands of equipment. Now, as you can understand, each brand of equipment works differently. Some may have power, maybe a little higher consumption. Some may have a little more water consumption. So it has to be a balanced decision as to what equipment can be used and what cannot be used for this problem. Hence, what happened is we, we have to sit with everybody, work out a working uh, balance, uh, not only from the CapEx, but also from OPEX point of view. So guiding the owner what is required to be fitted becomes one of, us, one of the leading responsibilities for us as, a, as also a, a guiders, guides to the, for the MEP consultants. Though I may not be designing the electrical distribution system, but with our knowledge, we guide the electrical con uh, consultant with their SLD drawings as to what sort of cabling, what should be the MCBs, and what sort of cable routing should be done to minimize the run of the cable. Otherwise, this can be disastrous in the cost and other things like it. So when, let, let's go back now to only the civil finishes. What are the civil finishes that we are talking about? We are talking of the floor finish. It becomes a very, very important aspect of hygiene. Then you have the wall finishes, right? From wall tiling to a stainless steel on the walls or maintenance-free tiles on the wall, thing like that. Then we have counters, various counters which are built and under which the equipment go in, especially in the front of house areas. Detailing of doors and windows, fire safe doors, fire exit doors, and other aspects of the, the overall look and touch feel of the operation of the kitchens. Now, I don't want to go too deep into each of these things. There's a huge story behind each one particular equipment and uh, material to be used. Let us look at the MEP requirements. We have 
electrical works to be done, which becomes a very big, strong part of it in any uh, MEP fit out for any equipment. We also have in this the detailing of the equipment, the power supply which is required for them, the kind of earthing that they need to be given, the electrical points which are how to be how to give you the right kind of sockets. Otherwise, sometimes you everybody is putting in IP65 sockets, each of them costing between eight to sixteen thousand rupees, and you end up with a huge bunch of sockets hanging all over all over the place, even if it is not needed. I mean, you don't need a massive sized electrical socket, you know, for running tabletop equipment. In fact, I saw in, in a kitchen in, in Delhi, where we had done the hotel's procurement, a bank of 30 sockets, each one costing 18 to 20,000 rupees just to run tabletop equipment. I mean, these sort of things should never be allowed to happen. And somebody has to check upon what socket is being used, what is the size of the cabling, whether the earthings have been prov provided or not, the circuit breakers, the MCBs, and other things are correctly, uh, correctly specified. So many things go into electricals. We can have a separate um, discussion on this, but just a basic guideline that whenever you redesign any electrical fitouts, there should be no flying wires and therefore no hazardous way of fitting out these equipment. Plumbing and drainage, right from the discharge from the equipment to floor washing to right up to the ETP or STP plants, the drainage system has to be properly planned so that you don't have flooding in the kitchen. You have proper treatment of the drainage using smaller grease traps all along the way. You have proper drain troughs. You have so many other things which are required. Coming to other aspects of MEP, like fire alarm and firefighting, it's, a, it's another science on its own. But I just would like to say that under the false ceiling and above the false ceiling are equally important using beam detectors and other things which are required. Kitchen ventilation is, a, is another major science in planning. So that has to be with the balancing of loads, both from the exhaust point of view, from the fresh air point of view, and to ensure that losses of air conditioning are minimized. These are based upon ASHRAE requirements and not more than 5% should be the differential factor. So when you're designing all these things, both the civil and the MEP have to work hand in hand so that they're properly fitted, easily maintained, and well looked after while during operations are being con con are conducted. Hence, I would say that the topic of this discussion was art of hospitality planning is not only just an art, but is a major science as well. Without putting in all the scientific detailing and people without the right experience can end up with a massively expensive project, maybe sometimes under, under provided or not taking care of aspects like fires from safety and from energy conservation, as Shavanji has pointed out so rightly. With this, I would like to bring my little introduction to this installation of kitchens and other things to an end and wish you that all sit down together as a team and guide everybody as one family so that our country benefits and we all go forward as some of the most efficient countries in building and operating properties. Thank you, Rajesh. I'll, I'll Thank hand you over so the private team. Thank you so much, sir. So I may request everybody to uh, switch on your cameras. So we have only 10 minutes left. So I feel we should take questions. Now, the uh, a couple of things that, you know, uh, uh, we will have to, uh, you know, request Mr. Dal Advani to do this all over again uh, on the 5th when we are doing another uh, semi uh, event. And because the time is short now, we'll have to take a few questions. And also, there will be two other speakers on the 5th, so uh, please don't miss it. I would like to thank everybody here. But before that, uh, Ajo team, uh, do you have the questions that we can answer? And um, I would like uh, all of us uh, here to you know, take questions. And uh, uh, we would like to, uh, uh, Mr. Advani, you are on mute. Um, everybody may please uh, unmute. So. Before, you know, I think uh, we have to end it by four. Uh, I would like to uh, thank everybody for joining in for your very, very valuable inputs. Um, and then I think this is just the beginning of uh, a knowledge sharing session where uh, very, very important knowledge has been shared and very useful knowledge has been shared. 
lot of people would benefit from this and i'm sure it is recorded and it will be um, there on youtube uh, available for everybody so to see a few people uh, again uh, at the background who have worked very hard i would like to thank them especially rahul talwar who has been the backbone of this association um, he's unwell and uh, mr sanjeev deshmukh who really wanted to be a part of this but unfortunately there was a death in his family he could not so he would also be joining on the fifth where we going to check whether he can join so mr dail advani put a lot of efforts to bring this together thank you so much sir and everybody at uh, the ajo team and one uh, gentleman in particular who is a very dear friend of mine who has put in a lot of efforts to bring everybody together and who's uh, been at uh, the backdrop to help ajo uh, bring this up he's connected everybody is none another uh, vijay mohan bembe he is a is a very very dear friend and who's done a, a real uh, a good effort to bring everybody together and and i i would like to thank him and to appreciate his efforts uh ajo team please come on board yeah do yeah. you have any questions uh, yes and, we have yeah. a question we have question from the audience so the question is how frozen food can change the concept in hotel food industry so we request panelists to food. take up the question dial sir can you take up this question can you repeat the question again yes how frozen food can change the concept in hotel food industry yes dial sir please sir I think uh, frozen foods are already in use in a good number of hotels and restaurants. Good companies have come out with various products. ITC has a range of uh, cocktail starters. Godrej is developing a, a series of products. Besides the food coming in the frozen format. food is coming in the formats which is packed cooked in the retorts and packed so we are ready to use gravies which are from a retort or in the frozen format now what happens this is going to help us to cut down on our staff requirements cut down on the space requirements as the production of the basic foods will be minimized We'll cut down on the space. We'll cut down on the equipment cost, and we'll make things easy. In today's times, we have to have minimum staff working in our spaces, as per the norms laid down by the health authorities. There has to be a distance between two persons working in the kitchen, as on now. How long will the situation continue? Is to be seen and checked. So frozen foods. are going to be a big boom there is very good scope for developing more and more products besides what is already in the market what is in the market the quality needs to be upgraded to be upgraded to a higher level so that can be accepted by the five star premium hotels and the restaurants a good number of restaurants are already using range of products and they convert it into a product which is not even known to the guest that the product what he is consuming is a frozen product i have been personally doing a lot of research on the frozen products for the last 2 years and it's there are amazing results so a lot can be done a good investments can be made and the users the end users of hoteliers and the restaurants should encourage the use of these products and that's going to help them to cut down the cost of setups and operations thank you uh any uh, other questions uh, you have yeah uh, uh, this is a question which i have to ask uh, i mean this is my question uh, i have been following hospitality from last 3 4 years but recently in last one year i have seen uh, there's a lot of mock meats coming in the industry to promote sustainable vegetarian lifestyle uh, mock meats is started by some bollywood celebrities too they were pre existing brands and now uh, there are a lot of brands coming out for the mock meats or the vegetarian meat so how is hospitality looking up to it even we have a quite popular chef with us so i really want to look uh, know the perspective on this i request chef vishwanath to answer this 
Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in fact, I was at a factory last month uh, that produces mock meat and uh, mock meats is catching up in our sector. Uh, this has been there uh, from the 90s in the Southeast Asia. And, uh, but uh, we have a cultural sentiment in India for vegetarians when you, when you say meat. The word kebab itself is little offending. So when, when you look at meat, then it becomes even more offending. But yes, uh, today, uh, as the world is growing and people going abroad, uh, the liking for such meats have come in. And it also has a very good uh, nutritional value. There are places also that are coming up slowly uh, where, uh, you know, there are brands that are being created where uh, it's more a vegan kind of store where such things are being used. And uh, you have variants that are coming in. In, in fact, uh, you have these uh, uh, non-veg uh, mock meat burgers that come up with jackfruit and stuff like that, which are catching up very well. One of our, our clients is also using it. And uh, we are also setting up a space uh, in the same segment uh, by the name Only Plant. So uh, that, that's an upmarket uh, product line that's coming up uh, and it's catching up quite well also. Uh, yeah. Vishwanath ji, uh, yes. I would just like to add one small question on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing which you have spoken was on the perspective of a person involved in Horeka culture, but as a chef, what would you uh, prefer when it comes to taste? Do mock meat uh, like converges anywhere close to the taste of real meat? Well, I have yes, not yes. tasted any of it. At yes, it does. It, it, it is very close. In fact, uh, uh, it is it is little difficult for you to uh, really differentiate in case you're not told. And uh, uh, the factory that I was in, uh, we had a French chef who was coming and creating some recipes for him to take it abroad. So a lot of work that's happening in India because uh, and people are getting little aware and some people don't, who are getting vegan and looking at not uh, getting into meat, but they want to have the taste still. So a lot of things like that happening abroad. So people are looking at this segment. And uh, if, if a vegetarian who has tasted non-veg would love to eat that because he still stays vegetarian and enjoys that part of it also. Thank uh, you. I have a very quick question for uh, Mr. Naresh Sani. Uh, you, you've uh, done restaurants abroad. Uh, you know, it, It's a vast question, but you have only two minutes to answer because he has to wrap up. So... How, how different it is doing a project in, uh, in uh, uh, say, Dubai and doing in India because, you know, there, I think there are regulatory requirements. So uh, very quickly, because I, a lot of people would want to know, you know the regulatory requirements. The, you know. the difference between doing any FNB project in India and doing it abroad in, or a country like UAE, where the temperatures outside go to 52 degrees during the day, is that the governments there are very proactive in regulating and laying down standards right from construction to ventilation to temperature to food handling to refrigeration in the kitchens to the to the right fit outs for the flooring and ceiling they have something called as the dubai food code and they also have something called the civil defense code so from safety angle the civil defense code takes care of it and the Dubai Food Court takes care of it right from what finishes, what drainage systems, what ceiling, what wall tiling to see that there is no con contamination. Mm -hmm. Plus, they also put in the movement of everything, which becomes very important for any FNB operation to get the license. That means you have to convince the officer who's going to give you the license that you have considered the movement of manpower, machinery, equipment, raw food, and garbage, how they are going to move around and give you a complete operation which prevents chances of any contamination. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Mr. I think Nadesh. you have a second, only second, uh, few seconds. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Rajesh. Rajesh, Rajesh, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but uh, as planned, we have to move to our next session. Yeah, yeah. yeah for the day. I thank all the guest esteemed speakers for this really insightful session. This session literally woke me up and made me listen the entire insightful discussion which we had here our audience really loved it thank you everyone for joining thanks uh, a lot thanks a lot we thank mr thank you so much. also please everybody have a nice day. who had contributed a lot to this and stay safe thank you yeah.